Welcome to Discourse. I'm Susil Pandey. Nepal has already adopted a federal system, so now the issue is not about whether to choose federalism or decentralization. In fact, federalism is a political concept that refers to a system of government in which federal government and provincial governments constitutionally share sovereignty. However, federalism is not panacea to all problems. Rather, it is an opportunity to address expectations and aspirations of the people. Today, I am going to talk with Dr. Leslie Seidel on federalism of Nepal. Dr. Seidel, a Canadian citizen, is a senior advisor to Forum of Federations, the global network of federalism and devolved governance. Dr. Seidel, welcome to the show. Glad to be here. You are a senior advisor to Forum of Federation and you are an expert on federalism. Nepal has been already federated itself and what do you want to suggest to Nepal? Well, I, uh, I'm not uh, here to, to give advice to Nepal or to uh, Nepali people. We are here as, uh, as visitors uh, sharing information about other federal countries, including the ones that we come from. Yeah. But I would say first thing that uh, Nepal has reached a, a, a very important uh, stage in its history because it has moved from being a, a, a monarchy, a civil war uh, went on, and it became a, a democracy. Uh, constituent Assembly worked for seven years, two Constituent Assemblies, yeah. uh, developing the new Constitution. Mm -hmm. And that is a, a very important uh, achievement. And I see federalism as 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 moving parallel with with democracy because one of the things that federalism does is it creates more uh, institutions for people to participate mm -hmm. uh, under the new constitution there will be provincial governments uh, with elected assemblies mm -hmm. and local governments will be elected uh, once again they've not been elected for almost uh, 20 years in Nepal mm -hmm. the other thing uh, about uh, the federalism that has been uh, outlined in the Constitution, because not everything is in the Constitution, there will be an implementation phase and laws to pass, but one of the impressive parts of the Constitution is the degree to which the diversity of Nepal is recognized in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. I know there's a, a debate going on about whether that's adequate for some groups, but uh, there are a lot of uh, important elements in the mm -hmm. Constitution that that reflect the, the, the diversity of Nepal, the linguistic diversity, yeah. the uh, ethnocultural diversity, and also the, the social diversity with, mm -hmm. with certain underprivileged groups like Dalits mm -hmm. having, having recognition in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Geographically, or in terms of geography, physicality, Nepal is not so big country, but in terms of diversity, it is a very big country in the sense that it has more than 100 plus castes. And what do you think? Is it appropriate for Nepal to adopt federalism to decentralize the power, or decentralization itself is appropriate? Federalism is, is, is appropriate for Nepal uh, for, for a couple of reasons, one related to the diversity uh, of the people, but another related to the diversity of, of the country. Yeah. I'll start with the, the second one because it's, it's a little simpler. Uh, when I was preparing to come to Nepal the first time in June, uh, I was uh, surprised to read about the different regions of the country. I thought that Nepal was mostly uh, mountain and the what we call it, uh, in Canada foothills, the lower part yeah. of the mountain. Mm -hmm. And then I came here and the first event that I participated in was in Bharatnagar. I arrived in Kathmandu and the next day I flew to Bharatnagar where my colleagues were already uh, ready for the meeting and we had a, a session with people, we had about a hundred people there and so I, I, I saw the, the Tarai for the, for, on my first, first full day in, yeah. uh, in, uh, in Nepal. Mm. So uh, federalism can respond to this geographical diversity because it's not only that the regions are different as far as 
being more hilly and mountainous, but also the economies are different. The Terai is is the agricultural motor of Nepal, mm -hmm. and uh, that means that some of the interests are different than, for example, in the northwest. Yeah. Uh, and Dr. Seidel, in, in I'm asking. I'm asking these questions in view of different aspirations of the people. For example, as you have said that there are different castes and different communities and religious groups. And what happened in Nepal uh, is they are demanding separate states in terms of castes also. Some are analyzing in terms of that. And won't be a, a greater difficult uh, problem uh, well, I don't think they're they're asking for separate states. Actually, uh, the the castes. Uh, it will be a challenge because, for example, the the section in the Bill of Rights on social justice, there's a very long list of groups, uh, including uh, uh, even uh, poor people, peasants, I think is the word that is used there. And it says that these people are to be represented in yeah. the various state bodies. Mm -hmm. And the amendment that's been put down, if I understand it correctly, would make that proportional representation in the state bodies. It will be very challenging because not all of these bodies uh, are covered accurately in the census, or they, maybe they are, but I'm not so sure they are. And so uh, uh, over time, I think what will need to happen is governments will need to adopt policies that will help guide uh, the, the uh, civil servants who are working to to build the various bodies that are going to be formed. One of the things that seems to me very important for the future of Nepal, and I am not lecturing here, I'm simply suggesting it, we've yeah. been here now for a total of five weeks, uh, I think people need to adopt a less conflictual view yeah. of uh, the Constitution. Yes, Nepal has gone through a very polarized uh, history and so on, and there's some very hard issues that still remain. But in order to make federalism work, yeah. people have to begin uh, to have a dialogue. They need to have some give and take. Yeah. You can't always have everything that you want mm -hmm. in uh, federalism. It's the same thing in a unitary state. It's yeah. the same thing in any form of government. Mm -hmm. uh, but there, I can understand at this moment in Nepal's history why people are asking for a lot because it's it's a moment of formation and i think it's also without maybe calling it that i think some people see it as a moment of reconciliation uh, but i think that's a minority view but as moving forward uh if people adopt uh, a view that that there is it's 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 not a completely open book because mm -hmm. many things are written down yeah. but all the details are not there some of it will be settled through other laws through programs uh, through uh, regulations and so on so the the federal constitution is is the bedrock yeah. on which nepal will move forward and there will be a, a long period of implementation and adjustment yeah. and federalism is never uh, a final thing okay. it's not like a um, Magic a, wagon. It's not like a marble slab yeah. on the wall from mm -hmm. a temple where the words are inscribed oh. and you can't change them because they're there forever until maybe it wears down from the rain. Mm -hmm. Federalism is always evolving and that's yeah. one of its strong points. Mm -hmm. There are two kinds of school of thought. One is federalism would work in Nepal and another, some experts, some people, some analyst, analysts say that federalism can't work in Nepal. Uh, because they argue that federalism cannot be sustained in such a small country like Nepal and they argue that decentralization will be appropriate as our former uh, rulers used such kind of decentralization. If federalism aims to address the diversity, aims to maintain the social justice and if decentralization itself can do why we should adopt federalism, their right well, to argue like that. I've heard lots of people say that even with the decentralization that existed previously, there was still a uh, very strong domination uh, of the country by a small number of people. We call them elites, mm -hmm. and particularly from the hill castes and so on. The advantage of federalism is 
that it's not just about decentralization in the usual sense, in the sense of sharing power geographically throughout the country. It's also about the reconciliation, the recognition of diversity. And the federal constitution is an, a step forward over the decentralized regime because not only does it recognize the diversity but it provides guarantees mm -hmm. because the constitution cannot be changed except by a special procedure it has to be two-thirds vote of parliament to change the constitution whereas an ordinary law for example local government election act or whatever that can be changed just with a simple majority mm -hmm. so uh, the, these these recognitions are there in the constitution and just like in other federal countries they are much more difficult to change yeah. and the reason is because they're a reflection of some fundamental principles and when you write down the fundamental principles you shouldn't be able to change them just you know, you know you wake up one Monday morning the Prime Minister says I want to change the Constitution because I don't like this part uh -huh. well under a federal constitution you can't do that it takes mm -hmm. a higher level of consent mm -hmm. The basic principles of Nepali federalism is to craft federal states on the basis of identity and capability. Okay, some people emphasize only on identity, and some people emphasize to give priority to the capacity or economic viability. As an expert on federalism, what will be the what will be uh, important factor to federate country like Nepal. Well, these these two uh, groups of of principles, uh, there's no perfect balance. It's not mathematical, but uh, in the debate so far, uh, it's quite plain that the capacity issue has meant that uh, you can't create an infinite number of provinces. Uh, if you were to say, well, you know, all the minorities in the country that have more than 2% of the population or even 5%, th each will have a province. Yeah. It won't work because uh, the, the, there's not enough capacity within such small provinces. And it won't work for another reason, which is because some of the minorities are more spread out. The Madeshi are concentrated, yeah. but some of the others, like Taru, uh, are, are, are fewer in number mm -hmm. and more spread out in the country. Yeah. It's very difficult to create provinces when a minority is spread out. In Canada, we have Quebec, which has about 25% of the population, and about 90% of Quebecers are French-speaking by birth. That's their first language that they learned. Mm -hmm. There's a small English minority. But in the rest of the country, we have about 1 million people who are French-speaking by mother tongue. We call them francophones. Mm -hmm. They can't be a province because they're they're spread out in the different provinces. There are some yeah. bigger concentrations. But nevertheless, within the provinces, uh, Ontario and New Brunswick, there are special rights for the francophone minority. Uh -huh. In fact, New Brunswick is actually an officially bilingual province, mm -hmm. officially French and English. So one of the strengths of federalism is that uh, with uh, uh, one hopes units that are viable economically, they will have the flexibility as they implement Which the laws. Which one is important, so identity or economic viability? Both are important. Because, because if you don't... The first, first priority goes to which one? No, I, 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 I don't think you yeah. you can you can just say this Fire one race. this yeah. one wins like in cards mm -hmm. where you put down the Joker yeah. and uh, it's it it trumps everything. Mm -hmm. No, no, you have to work you have to work together. Yeah. The, the thing about federalism is that it is it is at all times uh, a compromise between what may seem to be competing principles. Uh -huh. One of the ways it's described is a combination of yeah. divided mm -hmm. rule and shared rule, yeah. but. The shared rule refers to the national unity and so yeah. on. But if you have too much national unity, then the minorities will feel that they are not being respected. Whereas if you go the other way and you say we, we, the rights of the minorities are going to always rule over the national purpose, then you'll have a mess. It will fall apart. So you need to find uh, some kind of a balance, but the balance may change over time. Uh, Spain is uh, uh, a country that's not technically federal but almost federal. Mm -hmm. 
in since 1978, since uh, General Franco died, mm -hmm. uh, they democratized. And the decentralization of powers has been very significant because there are two regions, Catalonia and the Basque Country, yeah. that, that have been pressing for a lot more autonomy. So Spain in 2015 looks very different from Spain in 1978. Mm -hmm. It means there is not a single formula to adopt for federalism, eh? No, there's no single formula. You can learn from, from experience elsewhere. Oh. You can learn from thing, like, things that have worked well, oh. but you can also learn from things that have and not worked well. Let's talk about the experience of your country, Canada. Canada was federated in 1867. That's right. It has already been more than almost 150 years. Okay. It has a lot of experience. Then what, how should Nepal, what should Nepal learn from the country like Canada to federate? Well, I'd, I'd uh, make, make two points. One is um, there will be, going forward, some big challenges in Nepal uh, on the identity side. Let's set aside the economic side. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there are going to be challenges there. Nepal is a developing country. It's just come through a terrible period with the earthquake and so uh, on. I just want we've to had no. Let, let me answer. Oh. We've we've had big challenges in Canada. We had a separatist movement in Quebec. We had two referendums uh, uh, that were meant to decide whether Quebec would separate from Canada. And the second one in 1995, the uh, no side, the side that wanted Quebec to stay in Canada, won by only 50,000 votes, one half a percentage point. And what we have done to try to convince Quebecers to stay in Canada is to constantly modify the uh, position the Quebec government has and also to protect the language rights of Quebecers. From the 1960s, protecting language rights has been a national priority. Language rights are protected in our Charter of Rights. They have a very high level of protection. So uh, that's a lesson from Canada. It's, a, it's both a, a kind of a, a, a dark lesson in the sense that we had some crises, mm -hmm. but it's also a positive lesson. We got through them, but we didn't go th get through them by denying that we had a difficulty. We had to address the difficulty, take some very firm measures, and, and try to convince Quebecers to go forward with the rest of Canada. Mm -hmm. Canada is not as diverse as Nepal, yeah? That's why federalism will work uh, is working very well? Well, it depends on how you measure it. Uh, we have the French-speaking minority yeah, who are 25% of Canada, yeah. so that's a very significant minority concentrated in one province. Is there any conflict or sense of uh, being not addressed or respected? Not as much as there used to be, but one of the main reasons why the separatist party uh, was formed in the 1960s was because uh, French-speaking Canadians felt that they were not uh, respected, their rights were not recognized, and also they were poorer. They didn't have such good education, such yeah. good jobs, and their education level and their income have now risen mm -hmm. so that in Quebec, yeah. the French-speaking Quebecers are actually get have a higher level of income oh. than the English-speaking Quebecers. So there's been a transformation in 50 years on the socioeconomic side as well as it, it on takes 50 the identity. Years, almost 50 years, you said. Well, no, I'm just I'm just referring. I'm not saying it takes 50 years. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of progress oh. made in 20 years. I'm asking these questions in view of, uh, for example, in the uh, plain areas of Nepal that is called Torai or Madhes. Madhes is agitating for more than four months just nearby when Nepal, uh, the, the, the country, is promulgated new constitution. And they are saying that they are constantly marginalized, their views are not respected and hoped by the center, and they are demanding more autonomous type of uh, power. And what do you suggest as an expert? How can Nepal deal with such kind of problem and uh, resolve the problem? The 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 issue of uh, of the Madeshi and federalism obviously is is very important and and uh, uh, is 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 a very difficult issue. 
I can understand, based on what I know about the history of Nepal, why the Medeshi leaders are asking for more. Uh, this is an historic moment. They want to gain as much as they can from uh, this 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 historic moment where important things are being decided. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I am not sure that the leaders of the national political parties in Nepal have explained very well what is in the constitution and what the Madeshi are gaining through the new constitution. And one of the most important things they're gaining is that in province two, which is yeah. which runs across part of the Terai, mm -hmm. the Madeshi will be, depending upon how you measure it, they will be close to a majority there. Yeah. So uh, they will be very influential. If the provincial assembly decides to have a proportional electoral system mm -hmm. or a mixed electoral system, they will if everybody voted on Medeshi lines, which they wouldn't necessarily, mm -hmm. they will have almost 50% of the seats in the assembly. Yeah. And if they find an alliance with one other party that's maybe not so Medeshi, that's voting more with Hill people, mm -hmm. a party that wants to be in the middle, mm -hmm. then they'll be able to do amazing things together within the powers of the provincial government. They'll be able to set language laws, they can uh, shape their education system in a different way than it would be in Kathmandu. Mm -hmm. They might have education in, in their own language uh, for part of the school, uh, the, 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 the length of the school. All these things, of course, depend on resources because it is expensive to have two, two networks of schools. Yeah. But the Medeshi will in a way have a homeland mm -hmm. within Nepal, uh, not a homeland where they can do everything uh, exactly the way they want, yeah. but they will be very, very influential in a new space within then, Nepal, then a think, space that doesn't exist now. Then what do you think as an expert, why they are demanding more and agitating? because they want to get the most they can mm -hmm. out of this historic moment. Yes. I've said before that there's a train going by uh -huh. in Nepal and they want to put as much oh. freight <laughs> on the train uh -huh. uh, and gain as much because there isn't going to be another train going mm -hmm. by for a long time. Okay. This is, this is uh -huh. in a way, the founding of Nepal uh, or a re-founding of Nepal. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, very important okay. moment. Besides, uh, let me know about the Nepali constitution and your view on Nepali constitution because you have also presented some paper uh, held yesterday on Akan AT on conference uh, about Nepali constitution also and you know about the Nepali constitution yeah uh, let me know in view of the comparison uh, let's compare Nepali constitution with other constitution federal constitution uh, what is Nepali constitution or is it well the const I, I'd make two points about the constitution one is uh, it it does some of the things that have to be done in a federal country. It says that the federal government will have these responsibilities, provinces will have these responsibilities, and, and this is uh, not the case in many federations, mm -hmm. it also includes local government and it gives its responsibilities. And then it says that some responsibilities are going to be shared yeah. and there are lists in the, in the Constitution. There's maybe some clarification that will be required there. Governments will have to work together. Mm -hmm. For example, in the area of natural resources and the environment, there's some overlaps. But if governments want to work together and, and, and figure out more clarity, they can do I, it. I the other thing, no, I just let me, oh. let me answer, this is my second point. <laughs> uh, the other thing the Constitution does, as I said at the beginning, is to recognize and protect diversity. Uh, women have a guarantee of 33% in, yeah. the, in the national parliament, mm -hmm. in the lower house. There are commissions for women and Muslims and Dalits and so on. And there are many, many other recognitions of diversity. So that as I've, as I've said on more than, more than one occasion, it's a constitution for 2015. It's not a constitution that would have been written in 1955 because the, the, the sensitivities about these diversity issues oh. were not the same. But my concrete question is, is Nepali constitution okay, good, average or excellent as some people, most leaders used to say? 
the, the Nepali constitution is a very good basis for moving forward, mm -hmm. for setting the framework that will then be supplemented by laws and programs and by informal agreements and by intergovernmental mm -hmm. constitution, intergovernmental uh, uh, relations. Uh, there is, there, it is, it is a very impressive achievement. Uh, mm. Yes, it's not perfect. Yes, the process was maybe a little bit rushed in the summer. There should probably have been more consultation. Mm -hmm. I notice now with the amendment that the parties are debating, and some of them, yeah. some of them are saying, Nepali Congress is saying, let's not rush this amendment through. Let's have some time for public yeah. interaction. Maybe they've learned a lesson from the summer when it was it was probably too fast. The only way to improve the constitution, if there are any problems, is to amend it through the par parliament. Yeah. Uh, that's that's if 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 you really need to change the text, uh -huh. but there will be some uh, uh, directions, policy yeah. directions in the future mm -hmm. that will be done through laws and through intergovernmental relations and oh. so on. You don't need to go to the constitution uh, uh, to do everything. Uh, because that the constitution is meant to be a framework. The Nepali constitution is quite long and, and very detailed oh. for a fairly small country, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it should not be the practice. I realize why they want to go and amend it now, because they're trying to solve this major impasse through some amendments to the constitution, and that's okay. Uh, if that works, that'll be a good thing. But I don't think uh, that uh, people should be thinking, oh, if we find something else uh, next uh, March or whatever, we should have another constitutional amendment oh. bill. Because it has a way of turning the constitution into a kind of basket or a Christmas tree. Every time you want to, you want to make a little change, you must go and, oh. and put something more on the tree or take something off the tree. Constitutions are meant to be stable. They're meant to be long lasting then uh, what can Nepali government do to address the demands of the agitating people in Thorai well it it ha it is responding through uh, I, I realize amending the constitution it, didn't, as it, it was the, the amendments came from Nepali Congress but I believe they have the support of uh, UML uh, and uh, they should uh, I think they should uh, they should pass those maybe there will be some adjustments to that bill mm -hmm. uh, but uh, unfortunately the agitating forces parties are saying that such kind of amendment will not address the real demand of them well, the government will have to make a choice. Uh, it will have to decide I'm, I'm whether asking, it can go any further. I'm asking your suggestion. So, at that time, <laughs> in that condition, what should of federal government do? Uh, well, I don't want to. I don't want to uh, get into giving advice mm -hmm. on the because one of the issues I'm asking that this is the in view of international experiences. Uh, well, in I'm, that situation, what other federalists would do? Well, the, the, Nepal is, is in a small category of, of federal countries that have been formed from a unitary country. Yeah. So there are not a lot of lessons that can be taken from somewhere else. I can't just say to myself, oh, this country in this year provides the exact answer. The Nepal situation is unique. Mm -hmm. And there's an element that doesn't exist in some other countries, which is uh, there, there has been a, a tradition of violence in Nepal to press political demands. The civil war that went on for so many years, uh, I'm not suggesting that there's another civil war going to happen in Nepal, but the style of protest uh, is very different from what is what is used in other countries. In Belgium, there's a lot of disagreement between oh. the two linguistic groups, the French speaking and the Dutch speaking, but they don't block roads and prevent the ambulance from going through. When I was here last time, there was a boy died who was very sick, died in an ambulance on the east-west highway because the demonstrators, not the Indian government, they were Medeshi militants, were demonstrating on the east-west highway and they wouldn't let the uh, the ambulance through. But I don't think that's the best Nepal way to, to press. The has been saying an embargo, a blockade, has been imposed by our southern neighbor India. What do you think about that? Well, uh, I, I think uh, that that is not a good way 
to encourage change in Nepal. I think it would be better for the Indian government to sit down. Uh, I think the, the this is very dangerous politics. On the other hand, you cannot blame my understanding. I've been reading a lot since I've been here, talking to people. My understanding is that it is not only the Indian blockade that is causing the shortage of supplies in the country. Oh. It's also partly the demonstrations it is sponsored only by the by Madeshi Morcha. Yeah. Uh, and the border points, which are not disturbed by the agitators, are also closed. Yes, you're right. You're right. But but it's a combination of two dynamics that is going on. One dynamic is within the country. The Indians did not block the ambulance. Mm -hmm. The Indians did not kill the police uh, and the security forces yeah. with, with axes and spades. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I do not support that kind of violence, killing innocent people. Mm -hmm. uh, it, there's no moral reason to go that far to press mm -hmm. your demands. and. It's possible that the the Madeshi leaders actually yeah. hurt their cause mm. by resorting to that kind of violence. The recital uh, at the end of the program, okay. Uh, as you have said, Nepal uh, made promulgated a very good constitution. And do you think the demand of agitating political parties of the Tarai can be addressed within this constitution through amendment? My reading today is that uh, I don't think everything they want can be addressed, but I don't know where the political parties stand on the demarcation issue. Mm -hmm. They say that they're going to take some time, they're going to consider that, yeah. but that's not in the amendment bill right now. Mm -hmm. So uh, the situation is still very uh, tense and uh, some things could happen in the in the days and weeks ahead, uh, but at the moment, uh, I don't see how the main political parties in Parliament in Kathmandu uh, can respond, can accept everything that the most militant. You have to remember too that the the most militant demands are not supported according to what i hear by everybody living in the Terai. Mm -hmm. everybody living in the Terai does not support violence i'm sure that's the case so it's a question like always in politics who is speaking for the Medeshi people and are they are they reflecting accurately the sentiment in that region or are they pushing some of their own political interests I don't know I don't want to pronounce on that one but it's a very complex dynamic what do you want to suggest Nepali people at the end I would I would suggest that uh, they they the, the the political parties both the Medeshi ones and the national political parties take some time for a dialogue and try to find the a way through this amendment bill yeah. perhaps making some changes mm -hmm. to to try to get the largest level of agreement and try to calm down the atmosphere because people are hurting yeah. people uh, don't have cooking gas mm -hmm. children are sick they don't have medicine yeah. and so the 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 most extreme elements need to think beyond their own self-interest yeah. because it's not just mm. to deprive innocent people in any part of Nepal of the kinds of supplies and the economy is growing, grinding down, inflation is raising mm -hmm. and so on and it's a very concerning situation for somebody coming from elsewhere because it doesn't need to be that way. Okay. I'm very sorry also because you may be facing uh, inconvenience due to that kind of locket. I'm very sorry. Yeah, very sorry and thank you very much indeed Dr. Silent for your time and views. Thank you.